transliterate or translate the trademarks? Are there enough rules within the trademark uh, registries, we call them in India? Uh, how do you appoint arbitrators who really know those languages? For example, right now for .in, which are English domain names, we have arbitrators, panels all across the country. Now, if it comes to language, IDNs, we may either have to appoint arbitrators who know those languages, or we may have to appoint special linguistics with each arbitrator, which he can refer to. So that's one issue. A major issue we see is uh, variants. In India, we have, though we have about 700 languages listed in the census, officially we have English plus 22 Indian official languages. And we intend to launch uh, the CCTLD, especially in all these languages. Now, the issue of variants in Indian languages is not really limited to similar looking glyphs or similar sounding names. Uh, for example, in Marathi, half R, half R sound is almost similar to hyphen. So obviously hyphen will be allowed in the IDNs. So in Marathi, I have to block as a variant half R sound with the hyphen. Now, unfortunately, Marathi is a part of bigger Devanagari script table, which handles 11 of our official languages. So I'm forced to block this in 10 other official languages. So obviously, these kind of things will increase the number of variants. In some cases, for example, my own name, Rajesh Agarwal, only the surname Agarwal, I can write in about 40 different Unicode code point strings in Hindi alone, in Devanagari alone. So it has many dimensions. First, on the companies as well as on individuals, it puts a big load how to protect your name. You can't really do with registering three, four names. If it comes as a variant, OK. But otherwise, you have to register a lot of names, which are not covered by the variant tables. Now, another question which, in fact, we tried with the popular company names. Many times, two well-known trademark holders, if one registers the name first, the other name gets as a variant. How do we really handle this? Is it first come, first served? If both file uh, during sunrise period, what happens? So sometimes it can be bona fide blocking of the other genuine trademark. Sometimes it can be malafide. Uh, also, how to really distinguish it is going to be very tough not to crack. Then in CCTLDs, obviously, we understand that GAC will be involved, governments will be involved uh, at the uh, national level name. We intend to launch dot .bharat as soon as it is opened in multiple Indian languages. We are actively working on six, seven scripts for that and preparing variant tables for that. But in GTLD IDNs, again, a lot of legal issues are going to come. Obviously, .com is the most uh, marketable name. So a lot of people are working already on .com as it is pronounced in Indian languages, or its variants like .vanaj or .vepar or .bazar. Then it seems that a few nations internally have launched on what they call test bed basis, experimental basis, a few names in multiple languages, including some Indic languages. Now, does it give them a, some advantage when .com is filed in Hindi by anybody, let us say, uh, to ICANN when it is opened? Does running an experimental test pad in IDN, does it give you an advantage or it doesn't? Or will it cause confusion later on if ICANN approves somebody else for that name and the experimental test bed guy doesn't get it? That issue is definitely going to come up. Then one challenge, which is slightly different for us than other countries, may come up in CCTLD launch. We have 22 official languages. A few of them are still not very properly listed in Unicode. Uh, minor glitches there. Uh, so can I really afford to not launch them in first phase? Do I face any legal issues or political issues in launching a few languages first and 
a few languages later on or does it give because we have variants spanning across languages if i launch one language first does it give that language a advantage over the other language where the same string is a valid string in the other language which is launched in phase 2 so this phasing of languages in the same script table uh, may cause us some problems so to tied over that we are almost forced to launch the whole group of languages within that script at one time so i don't know whether it will work out for all the languages or not uh, our devnagari unicode page covers 11 languages bengali code page in unicode covers 3 4 languages uh, it covers bengali manipuri and also part of assamese so on that we are still not very clear that are any legal challenges or other political challenges are going to come before us in that so i think these are three four points which i thought are slightly different from other speakers points raised by other speakers so i would stop here and wait for your questions and also wait for ram mohan to give his presentation because ram and i have been working together on indic language variants so he may have a few points to add on these thoughts thank you thank you uh, rajesh for your perspectives uh, as far as dot uh, in registry is concerned i now invite uh, the last panelist that we have for this afternoon uh, Ram Mohan, who is the Chief Technology Officer and Vice President of Affiliates, which runs the .in and .info, and also who is now on the board of ICANN. Uh, Ram, can I request you to uh, sure. go there and make your presentation? And after Ram finishes, I am going to open up the floor for discussions and for any questions that you would have for our distinguished panelists. This is just to inform you that while we are waiting for Ram to start, uh, cyberlaws.net is also organizing another workshop tomorrow evening between 4.30 and 6, and that's on emerging cyber law issues of 2009. So those of you who would be interested will be very happy to have you over for the set uh, uh, workshop. And I think Thanks. Ram's all set to go. Over to you, Ram. Thank you, Pavan. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, being here. And I, I echo what uh, Rajesh was saying. Um, we're delighted that um, you, you made it here. And um, we're, we're really glad that um, you know, this conference uh, is continuing to move on in spite of the other challenges. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about some of the issues, uh, but perhaps with a somewhat different um, um, angle. Uh, we've had some really uh, excellent presentations uh, on, on the specific uh, legal issues, you know, Hong's presentations on uh, translation, transliteration of trademarks and UDRP from Pavan, uh, et cetera. But I thought I would, I would cover a few other areas also. Um, there are some sunrise issues, uh, some IDN variants and, and uh, related topics in that area. Uh, and then, from an operational perspective, how do you actually adhere to a court ruling? Let's say uh, a court comes to you and says, here is something you must do. Um, how do you actually make that happen? Uh, because there are some specific challenges with IDNs. Um, there's been some discussion already about who is and, uh, and also enforcing uh, shutdowns of the IDN data. While I'm doing this, um, I'll you know, intersperse my comments with uh, some of the, the work that, uh, that Rajesh and I have been doing with uh, IN itself. Because in, in some ways, uh, what's uh, the, the challenges inside of uh, .in with the 22 official languages, with uh, a few scripts that are used by many languages, uh, there's a many-to-many -many problem, you know, some scripts used by many languages. Uh, in, a, in, a, in at least one case, we have um, a language that uses um, more than one script. So on, on Sunrise itself, I mean, for those of you who don't know, typically a Sunrise is a protected period. And in that period, trademark holders um, get a priority right to register domain names. That's typically what a Sunrise period is. Uh, there are some questions that come up. Um, with IDNs, trademarks in which language? Is it on a, I mean, Hong was saying earlier that trademarks are regional in nature. Uh, but there's a question. If you have a trademark in, in India, for example, if you have a trademark in Marathi and a trademark in, uh, in Hindi, the script underlying them is pretty much the same. 
Uh, and in, in several cases, actually, it, it, it'll actually be represented uh, in two different ways, right? Who gets the priority? Uh, does the Marathi holder uh, get the priority, or is it the, the Hindi um, holder who gets a priority? What about the case that Rajesh was talking about, where you have um, you know, a, a, a particular uh, character that sounds similar to another one, uh, but that is part of a trademark uh, itself that has been registered. Um, what do you do? Uh, what happens if, as a registry, to avoid uh, phishing and other security issues, you decide to block certain characters? You say that these are uh, too confusingly similar, so you're going to block it. And then you have a court ruling that says you must allocate this because this is a, this is a legal trademark um, and you know, it is required. Can your registry or can your policies, uh, what, what, you know, you really cannot, uh, it's very hard anyway, to say no to a legal um, order that comes down to you. What do you do there? Uh, these questions are, are relatively o o open. Similarly, you know, Pavan is talking about prior rights in, um, uh, in other TLDs. There is a related topic, which is prior rights in other languages. Uh, if, you, if you have a trademark, and if you have a domain name that has been registered with a trademark in, in language one, and let's say languages two, three, four, and five, which use the same script underneath it, uh, are going to be implemented by the registry, do you automatically get a prior right in those languages? I know in the case of uh, uh, you know some of the things that we've been working with the Arabic script working group, um, you know you can have a, you can have a string that looks exactly the same, uh, but actually underlying it underneath it, it actually uses completely different uh, Unicode characters for it, right? Uh, but if you talk to folks who are, who are actually in that region, they will say, well, um, a domain name that is, say, in Arabic and a domain name that is, say, in Persian, okay, they are clearly two separate languages. So you, you, know, you may not want to, to give priority rights uh, just because a name was uh, trademarked in Arabic that the uh, equivalent name in Persian um, is, is given. Uh, and and, and the, the same registrant is given a prior right. Um, and the last point there is uh, competing marks in the same script but different languages. Uh, how do you actually differentiate uh, when you have characters that, that are not only looking the same but are actually the same? To the computer, the characters are exactly the same, right? But, they, but, but the languages using them uh, are quite different. So, so uh, again, in, in the case of uh, Devanagari in, in India, there are 12 languages that utilize the same uh, Unicode table. And obviously, they use different subsets of it, right? Uh, so there are some implementation and some uh, clear operational challenges uh, when, when you go about doing Sunrise. Now, variance itself, uh, variant is typically a character that looks the same to the naked eye uh, as another character, but it actually has a different computer code associated with it. And you can see uh, uh, there's, there's a block there, but actually um, in Tamil and Malayalam as an example, there are two different code points, uh, 0BB5 and 0D16. Uh, and what, what should be showing up is that there is a Malayalam character that looks exactly the same as the Tamil character there. It looks identical, right? Uh, and that's typically considered a variant. One is a variant of the other. Um, and, and generally, variants are visually confusable. Homophones typically are out of scope. But then we heard uh, Rajesh talk about a specific case in Marathi where you know, a homophone may not be out of scope. Um, one, of the, one of the things that if you're a registry or if you're implementing from a legal perspective is registries are, are it's not enough that you just conform to what the protocol is or what the core rules are. Registries typically have to come up with special extra rules and policies, right? Uh, and those rules and policies basically say uh, what sets of characters are considered the same as another set of characters. That, you know, what is the variant of a given name? That's one of the things that they have to do. Having done that, how will those variants actually be allocated? Um, and will those allocations actually um, survive a legal challenge and a legal test? 
So one option that has been discussed is if you have a given name that, that somebody wants to register, the, through, a, uh, through some computational calculations based on languages and linguistic analysis as well as technical analysis, you go and you create a, a set of all the other characters uh, that look similar, that look the same as the one that was requested, right? You call that a package of, of, uh, of names. You take those and you say, so if I ask for a particular name, and so that name is considered a primary name, uh, you generate these lists of variants, these lists of characters that are all um, confusingly similar, that look visually the same as the one that was requested. Um, one option is when you're registering these names that all of these names in the variant, in, in this package, right, that they uh, basically become children of the primary name. They have all the attributes, they have the same DNA, if you will, as the primary name. Um, and if someone looks up a variant, someone says, I, I want to, they go to the who is and they say, they type in the variant, what comes back is actually the record for the primary ID and domain name, not just the variant, because they are packaged and bundled and tied together. Um, what happens when you actually activate it? We have some registries in, in the experimental basis. You have registries that have actually said you can activate a variant. You have other registries where they say variants cannot be activated. They're just bundled and packaged together, right? But if you are the actual person who bought the primary name, do you automatically have a legal right over all the variants of that name? You may not have paid for it. In fact, in most cases, uh, in the current implementations, Variants by default are not something you pay for, right? So if you don't pay for it, do you still have a legal right to it? Can you just be challenged? Um, typically, the, the, the organizations selling the variants uh, don't sell variants to you. They just sell the primary domain name uh, to you, or they give it to you, allocate it to you, right? Um, but let's say, let's take the case where these names, these variants, actually get activated. Right? Once they're activated, then they can be used for anything. And there is uh, not necessarily a rule that says that a variant must go to the same spot as a primary domain name. Right? So what happens in, in, in that area where you have uh, two names, two, d two actual domain name labels, or two different websites, okay, website IDs, they look exactly the same, but they go to different places. Right? Um, does someone have the ability to come up and say the registry was wrong and force the registry to change its policy for all the other names that the registry has done? And if that is the case, then you know what is the mechanism? Um, to uh, do you grandfather what has already been um, uh, put out? You know how do you conform to a legal ruling or a court ruling that comes up and says you must not do this? Um, you know. Another interesting area inside of variants is, and this is something that is going to happen, right? We know that in, in the case of uh, CDNC, the Chinese Domain Name Consortium, uh, some of this has already happened. Um, I don't know Chinese, uh, but what I have been told is the following. It's possible that you have a domain name, and this is, uh, so, so this is not an exact example, but I'm giving it as an analogy, okay? Uh, it's possible, I'm told, that somebody can register the domain name cat, right? The animal cat. And it's possible that one of the variants of that is, um, you know, another name that is meaningful, that is an actual trademark, um, and, and that can be claimed, right? Specifically claimed. And in that case, um, the, the person who registered cat automatically got this other trade name, uh, trademark, as a variant, bundled, packaged, and given to them, right? They were, they were provided that name. Someone else, the, the, the legal owner uh, of that trademark name, right, that, that is considered a variant, goes to court and gets a court order that says this variant should actually belong to me, and not only should it belong to me, it has to be activated and it has to be treated as a primary name. It should not be treated as a child, you know, variant name, right? Uh, so that basically means you promote a name that was previously a variant, you had to promote it to, to being a, um, uh, a primary IDN. 
So what should happen when it is promoted? Uh, does that name automatically become activated? Uh, does it automatically then become decoupled from the old primary IDN, right? Will you add extra time um, to that name? And uh, one, of the, one of the more sticky issues, let's say that original name got, oh, sorry, the, the, the variant gets deleted. What happens? Does the registry still have to maintain that variant as a separate name, even though there is no longer an owner associated with it? Or does the registry simply say, OK, it, the original rule is still right linguistically and, and, and visually. They, they look confusing. Therefore, they should go back to being bundled. Uh, and one of the questions is, if you do that, are you then in violation of a court order? Uh, there are a few other uh, topics that I want to just run through relatively quickly. Um, so if you look at, um, I, I was talking about Malayalam and Tamil as an example before, two Indian languages uh, that have some characters that look the same between them, right? Um, and th there is, a, there is a, an idea that uh, each domain name gets a language tag associated with it. So a domain name is tagged as Malayalam, another domain name is tagged as Tamil as an example, right? Uh, so one policy that is potentially uh, possible is that the registrant, the person who wants to register the domain name, you come to the, your re registrar or the, or the registry and you say, I want the name in Tamil. I know that it has variants in other, in other languages. Okay, Do whatever you want to do with it. I only want it in my language. right? Uh, and the question is, if you're a registry or if you're a registrar, are you legally required, uh, even if the, the actual user tells you specifically, I only want it in the following language, right? Are you legally required to block it, lock it, make it available in all the other um, variants in the other languages? Uh, another question that is um, likely to come up and in, in the GTLD and CCTLD cases in, inside of ICANN, I know Bahir, uh, you've probably seen this issue come up already, which is the length. What is the what should be a minimum length of an IDN uh, top-level domain name? Um, in ASCII TLDs, most ASCII TLDs, the minimum length uh, is you know of a second-level domain name is three characters long. Of course, at the top level in ASCII, it's you know it goes from two two to whatever, right? Um, but in in IDN. Should there be a minimum length? Currently, ICANN has a, uh, a policy recommendation that says that there should be a minimum length for an IDN top-level domain, and that it should be at least three characters long. Um, I know in the Indian context, uh, there are a couple of cases where that, that'll probably pose problems. It's not very big in, in the Indian context, but I certainly uh, believe that in the Chinese context, Hong, that there is potentially a problem. No, OK. Uh, uh, there was some discussion at the, uh, at the prior ICANN Cairo meeting about you know, that, that it's too restrictive. Having uh, three characters as a minimum is too restrictive. Uh, we had enough discussion, quite a bit of discussion about IDN dispute resolution, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on these sets of slides. Um, but there are, there are some criteria that probably ought to be considered when disputes are, are being registered. Um, and are being adjudicated. The general policies for adjudicating disputes in ASCII to domain names, uh, in my opinion, are completely okay for uh, the, the IDN case, right? The, the principles are the same, so I don't think there are new legal challenges or legal issues um, for, for the general dispute resolution process. Um, however, Dispute resolution processes do not actually provide guidance today about variants. How many variants uh, should be awarded if uh, if there is a you know there's a case that says domain name must be allocated to a complainant, right? It doesn't really provide guidance about variants. And as Pavan was saying earlier, arbitrators uh, who understand languages and IDNs um, are are needed. 
Uh, very quickly on <clears throat> very quickly on who is in data accuracy. You all know that who is is uh, probably the best known way to identify who owns a domain name or who is the um, you know which registry runs it, which registrar is is registering the names, etc. I expect that IDN domain names will inevitably lead to the contact information um, for a given domain name to be multilingual. So imagine a domain name um, you know, in Telugu, which is the uh, local language here in Hyderabad, right? Imagine a, dom a domain name in Telugu with all the contact information in Telugu, and it's being used in a phishing attack uh, in Norway. Um, it's going to be interesting, I think, for a Norwegian um, regulator to try and figure out uh, what's actually going on uh, with this name and uh, what to do um, with this name. How do you actually track the person or do you actually know what is being said? Um, which brings me to the last uh, point here. If you're trying to shut down a domain name, and if you're a regulator, if you're in law enforcement, if you're, um, you know, a um, a registry or a registrar, in any of those cases, usually domain names get shut down uh, due to illegal or criminal use of these names. There is not really a global policy on this. It tends to be um, subject to local policies, either either GTLD, ICANN policies, or it gets subject to uh, country code uh, policies and the laws in, in the countries, right? Um, and as I was saying before, I expect that enforcement of shutdowns might be far, far more difficult if you're an ISP, if you're a hosting company that is managing a domain name or a set of domain names, and if they have a lot of multilingual IDN content in them, uh, I suspect that it might, you, you, we will get to some set of false positives where somebody just makes a complaint and says, this name is bad. And the, the, the hosting company or the ISP or the registry even that you know, needs to do due diligence, that process gets, I think, vastly co more complicated um, if you really want to do, follow due process and uh, allow you know, all the different uh, folks involved in the chain to, to do the right thing. So that's, um, in, 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 a, in, a, in a brief um, way, some sets of challenges. Some of these are operational. Some of these are, uh, are focused on uh, implementation uh, areas. But uh, you know, Pavan is saying you know, this is a Pandora's box. And I'm reminded uh, of, the, of the redeeming feature in that story is that, along with all the other things, there was also hope. Uh, that came through. So that's, what I, that's where I'm at. I'm very hopeful that uh, as we expose these topics and as we actually talk about these issues, that we'll be able to uh, hopefully be able to understand the ramifications, develop policies, develop uh, some, some general frameworks and guidelines that work across the board, right? Because IDNs by themselves are not something, um, my opinion, not something so different uh, that you have to abandon whatever uh, has already worked in the ASCII area. Uh, I suspect in many cases you can take what's already worked and you can adapt it uh, to work well in a multilingual context. Uh, there are only a few areas in the multilingual context where you have to build brand new rules and you have to br build brand new practices. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm very hopeful that uh, we're, we're going to have a, a good resolution to a lot of these issues. Thank you, Pavan. Thanks, Nam. That was Ram Mohan uh, giving us the perspectives on the legal aspects. I totally believe that reinvention of the wheel is not the order of the day. Uh, we need to only build on what's been built upon and then move forward. I think I'm uh, going to open the house now for any questions, clarifications. Uh, can you please identify your name, uh, your organization, and to a specific panel member or the entire panel that you want to address your questions? Is there some uh, mics in the room? If not, I think the room is small enough. If you can stand up and are there some mic, please? Please, can you circulate the mic? Uh, I can see a question right behind the cameraman. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to congratulate all the presenters for the fantastic presentation. Um, my name is Adam Mambi, um, the lawyer from the uh, Tanzania Communication Regulatory Authority. Uh, here we are talking um, on legal issues related to 
um, domain names uh, primarily. There are so many legal issues, it can take us even two weeks. But to me, I see one of the, the critical issues is uh, the, the question of cyber squatting. This is a, a critical issue, cyber squatting of domain names. And here we are talking, because we, you, we have seen so many examples of cases like uh, Max Spencer, Nissan, and other, other cases. People opted to go to, to court. But now we are talking of UDRP, uh, this Uniform uh, Dispute Resolution Policies. Some kind of arbitration uh, is like ADR, or Alternative Dispute Resolution. I was just asking myself uh, that why can't we have uh, a legal basis or legal backing of this kind of policy? Because otherwise, you see other countries like the US, they already have laws in place. Uh, that's the US anti cyber squatting Consumer Protection Act. And again, at the international level, because sometimes, if, as, as uh, the presenter said, that people are registering um, uh, domain names using someone's other trademark. You have the trademark, you have registered, but someone can register it as a domain name. Now with trademark, we have international laws like uh, Madrid Agreement and other laws. Why can't we have uh, a legal framework at international level to support this kind of uh, dispute resolution? Okay. That's, uh, that's my question. I'm, I'm trying to, to think about that. And again to the lady from, I don't know, is from China. As she said that there is a problem with trademark because it's a territory. But can't you register at international level and become international so that you can get a wider protection? Great. I think I'll be. Oh, thanks for the question. It's very interesting. Uh, the, the first point is that um, that we should support the development of law and dispute resolution policy against cyber scorting. Yes, absolutely. My, uh, my, my um, I agree with you. Uh, but the, the issue here is that when we extend uh, the legal protection to the cyberspace, to the internet, we have to be minded about the proper balance in, in the original trademark law. And <laughs> you extend trademark protection to a new media on the internet, it doesn't mean that you got extra legal protection. Uh, to my understanding, the anti cyber Scouting Consumer Protection Act, ACPA, uh, adopted by the United States, it seems has uh, some bias against the domain name holder, because it's my personal opinion. And, and about China, we, we don't have law um, so far. Uh, we use trademark law, the general trademark law, to resolve the, uh, the conflict between domain names uh, and, and trademarks. Uh, and we have a CNDRP, uh, that, that is a Chinese equivalent for EDRP, specifically for .cn, a domain name registered, and a .cn, our country called Total of a Domain. Say some time on call. In most of the registry dispute resolution policies, you would find clauses rela relating to bad faith registrations. Now, in IDNs, an interesting uh, thing, new thing which comes up is, uh, it's very difficult to distinguish between good faith and bad faith registrations. Like Ram Mohan gave example in Chinese of animal cat <laughs> conflicting with a, its variant conflicting with a well-known trademark. Now it's very difficult to say whether this fellow who registered cat, he did it in bad faith to grab that other name, or he's a genuine cat lover and uh, he really wanted the cat domain name. So how do you really cover it in the policy, or do you decide on case-to-case -case basis? At the moment, we have no clue how we are going to place this clause in our registry. Thank you. Now, uh, trademark uh, is, is a law for a particular field, for commerce. Now, by uh, using trademark law as, as, a pri as a first step in, uh, while registering internet domain names and, in, and IDNs, uh, it, becomes, uh, it makes the internet, the World Wide Web actually specifically, a place of commerce and commerce alone. Now, uh, I'm concerned about the free speech uh, issues pertaining to that. Now, and second, uh, and uh, also about the uh, question of bad faith, uh, I, I think especially in the uh, UDRP uh, 
judgments, sometimes barments. Okay, they're not. Uh, if one is satisfied, then then the uh, they're cumulative, right? So now now the thing is, bad faith is often has uh, through uh, judgments been uh, through uh, decisions rather been watered down. Okay, and and I think there's a requirement to assert bad faith as a as a requirement, uh, especially when we're uh, going, uh, especially uh, you know in in line of my concerns about trademark law. And thirdly, uh, the issue. Uh, it's it's a uh, I completely agree with uh, you, sir, when you're talking about the many-to-many -many problem. Now uh, that problem is is between uh, different scripts being used uh, by a single language, different uh, languages using a single script, also uh, diff uh, the same language being used in different regions. That is why uh, something that Mr. Dugal raised uh, about uh, uh, local and and regional. Uh, Arbitrary uh, arbitrations. Okay, that might be a problem because uh, while Tamil is used in, in Tamil Nadu in India, it's also used in Malaysia. It's also used in other parts of the world, right? So uh, that becomes a, a, a problem that way. So you have to, uh, th there are uh, a lot of uh, not not just strictly legal, but but even uh, uh, problems at, at the brass tacks level, but even at the conceptual level. Turning to reiteration. <laughs> Anyone in the panel? Uh, Udram, would you want to take this on? On free speech, we have some interesting uh, arbitration cases, not only to Data.in, but also to .com. For example, if somebody registers a well-known celebrity name, name like RajivGandhi.in or RajivGandhi.com, is it really in bad faith, or the fellow is a genuine follower of that celebrity, or is it to malign that celebrity? So on case-to-case -case basis, judgments have been made. So now opening. Uh, let us say individual names during sunrise period to non-trademark holders. Uh, that really makes it uh, really a, a WWW, but in the wild, wild west uh, fashion. Uh, so, <laughs> so in my city, Delhi alone, there are 5,000 Rajesh Agarwals. So, if <laughs> so, you can guess. So that's why I think they restricted it to trademark. I th what? I think I just wanted to add further here from an from arbitrator's perspective and having done a lot of UDRP decisions. You see, when you, uh, these kind of matters come before you, you invariably would want to see the intent. Now, the intent can be seen from various aspects of the conduct. Now, at la there are a lot of these clever people around who still don't want to make an offer for sale or have any kind of uh, those direct cogent acts done which could contribute as bad faith. But I think today arbitrators are increasingly proactive and inclined to look at the overall perspectives to decide what exactly is bad faith. And I personally believe the way bad faith began and the way it's now come up to, the ambit has been constantly increased in its, uh, in its depth as also in its applicability. Uh, and uh, therefore, I agree with your thought process that uh, as far as your local people are concerned, linguistics are concerned, it will have to be some kind of a uniform approach. So just the arbitrators for Tamil at Tamil Nadu, who may be slightly different in their approach, for Tamil in Malaysia, which is a slightly different kind of... One thing that has typically saved us is that the domain name comes under a particular jurisdiction. So .in, if it is in Tamil in .in, it would come under the Indian law. And if it is in Sri Lanka, it would come under Sri Lankan law. right? So that has typically saved us. And I expect that to persist with IDN top-level domain names as well. There's a question from Chuck Gomes there. Yeah. Thank you. First of all, let me say thanks for all of the thought that each of you put into this. Uh, just, just two quick comments. Uh, Num number one, uh, first one's a question, uh, a, a rhetorical question, I guess. Uh, have you submitted your questions to close in both cases? I'm not necessarily suggesting you submit them all because I actually think some of them have been answered already, uh, at least to some degree. Uh, the last thing is a comment. Uh, you've raised f great questions, a lot of questions that need answers, but we, I, I just want to communicate some caution. For years, we've been pursuing IDN, uh, IDNs for domain names, and we sat through some of us m multitudes of, of presentations that just presented all the reasons why we're not ready yet. So we need to balance this 
because I think all of you at the table there, probably the same as most people in the room, want the IDNs to happen. Uh, these questions do need answers, but if we wait for all of them to be answered perfectly, we will be waiting another five years, and I don't think any of us want that. Anyone in the panel? I think uh, let's begin building, and I think we can take it on. Anyone in the, uh, in the panel who would like to agree? Okay, sure. I think there's a question right in the back. Okay. Yeah, Ram, there was a point you made during the presentation about, let's say, somebody uses... Can you uh, identify your name for everybody? Yeah, I'm Lord Brar from I9 Holdings and DN Forum, and we are a domain investment company. Uh, during a presentation, you made a point, let's say, somebody's using an IDN domain for fishing in, let's say, Norway or Sweden, where the local, you know, regulator doesn't know what to do of it. But I'm just curious, how is an IDN different from a CCTLZ? You know, uh, because uh, let's say a uh, Hindi IDN would be with Mr. Agarwal. So they'll be uh, managing it. So if uh, it is used for fishing, then obviously the case would come to the re Indian regulator, not the Norwegian regulator, right? So, so perhaps I should explain the domain name that is registered. A, a, a domain name registered at an IDN top level or even at the second level, uh, all the contact information for this domain name is, say, in Hindi. 100% of all the contact data is in Hindi. And this domain name is being used for phishing in, as I was giving an example, in Norway, right? The problem is that for the Norwegian regulator, whoever is investigating it in Norway, it becomes very complicated for them to actually figure out what to do with the name. They, they can certainly try and, and go to Rajesh, but uh, you know, as famous as Rajesh is, he's probably not as well known in Norway, right? So the problem really is that uh, if you have a domain name that uh, has contact data um, that is completely multilingual, which is going to happen, right? The, the challenges are that instead of having everything in ASCII where today, if it is in .in, a Norwegian data, uh, re regulator can go and say this is a problem, and they, they can see the data. Interpreting that data becomes far harder uh, with multilingual content, um, with all the contact information. There's a question right at the back. Only um, a few characters to complete uh, our language, Spanish, and especially for Latin America. One of our opportunities in our region is that all, all speak Spanish, so it's very easy. But the sunrise of these kind of things is not for trademarks, it's for the domain name's owners. If you have a domain name that is need to change one letter or one character, you have the possibility. And then it's open the system. Uh, that's happened in the PE, dot .er, dot, uh, .mx, and another CCTLDs that have IDNs. The number of IDNs, are, the percent, is around half, 0.05 percent in the Rio. It's not a big issue. Um, maybe the problematic is not about uh, trade Mars, UDRPs, LDRPs, and other versions. But in the case of Peru, again, uh, we have only two cases in UDRP, a special UDRP for cctld.p and one is with IDN character. So we have the 50% of the case about IDNs in the dispute resolution improvement. The real problem is the people that have trademarks with uh, characters with IDNs that want a domain name. In especially in system with the CCTLDs don't have IDN support yet. They ask it that they have the domain name maybe with a variant but to register, like Cusqueña in, in, in Peru is a, a beer, a national beer, but that special character, N, is not the same. And use N or use NH to try to, to, to mix. Or in our case, only use uh, nothing to appear. The legal problem is more in the contract between the final user and the re registry to try to define who is the best owner of the domain name. But no, it's not only a problematic of trademarks. The name of the company, the name of the person. Uh, maybe the legal issues of this uh, problematic is not only about the dispute resolution. It may be more close who is the first owner or the best owner of a domain name when it's the first time they have 
uh, the possibility of have IDN in one CCTLD. Thank you. Um, that is a good comment. I see we have time, another about two minutes to wind up. Can we have one this final question before we wind up for the, this thing? Yeah. Yeah, Sevash, uh, uh, that, that's certainly a valid uh, issue that, that you know, hasn't yet been uh, addressed in, in, uh, in a specific way. Uh, and we do need some, some policies uh, to, to address that. Great. On that note, I'm going to wind up uh, the session. I'd like to thank all the uh, panelists for being here and giving their various inputs, uh, very detailed. I learned quite a lot, in-depth analysis of various aspects. Thanks for spending your valuable time and being a part of this. Quick two announcements that I've been handed over. Number one, uh, the cultural event and dinner today is going to be held at 7.30 p.m. Uh, at the Rock Heights at Shilpa Raman. So therefore, so shuttle services will be available from this venue to the dinner venue from 6.30 p.m. onwards. Delegates are requested to kindly avail this shuttle service. The dress code is informal. Shuttle services will be available from the dinner venue to their respective hotels from 9.45 in the evening. And the final announcement, somebody by the name of uh, Mr. Mawaki uh, Chango has uh, actually requested that could you please uh, help him. He has got an IGF backpack that is not his with no identifiable object inside. Somebody else has got his own bag which contains his passport and business card with his name uh, Mawaki Chango along with a book which is called Network Power. This is a lost and found desk. Uh, behind the regist forum registration desk, the person can possibly drop it there. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.